Good evening. So I'm delighted to welcome uh, Christoph Baranek back to Caltech. Uh, Christoph actually did his undergraduate degree here. Uh, and I learned yesterday, originally came here with aspirations of becoming a mathematician. Uh, after a couple of weeks of classes, he realized that wasn't intellectually stimulating enough, so he switched to astronomy. Uh, while here, he initially, I learned as well, uh, dabbled initially in radio astronomy instrumentation rather than optical instrumentation. Uh, he spent two summers uh, working at Owens Valley Radio Observatory with James Lamb and others. But in his junior year, he started working with Rich DeCaney and, his, uh, and Mitch Troy and in the Adaptive Optics Group in JPL, and his path was set. After completing his degree in, in, in Caltech, Chris had moved on to Arizona for his graduate studies where he worked with Roger Angel and Michael Hart. His dissertation was involved building the first laser ground layer adaptive optics system. Uh, Christoph graduated from Arizona in 2007 and came back to Caltech as a postdoc, initially to work on the PAM 3000 uh, system. While at Caltech, in addition to working on, on PAM 3000, Christoph came to lead the design, development, and construction of the Roboeo Ro 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 system. A robotic adaptive opt optics system currently stationed at the 60 inch telescope in Palomar and of course the subject of Christoph's talk today. So Christoph has just taken up, taken up the position of a assistant professor at the University of Hawaii where he will be developing and expanding the RoboAO concept in addition to working on other adaptive optics projects for uh, Keck and TMT. Without further ado, uh, I'll pass you over to Christoph. Uh, thank you very much, Greg. Appreciate that. Uh, very nice to, to be back here at Caltech, even though I've only really been gone uh, about three months. Uh, it's, it's very nice. Uh, there's a lot of people that I, I'm getting to catch up with already. Uh, it really, it almost seems like coming home. So, uh, thank you very much for this uh, chance to speak. Okay. Uh, so, I'll, I'll start. I'll uh, talk about the uh, the RoboAO system that we've developed for Palmer Observatory. Uh, this is the 60-inch dome. Uh, in uh, lit up with uh, headlights from a car, and we have the ultraviolet laser uh, propagating from the 60-inch dome. Uh, it appears as though it, it appears orange. Uh, this is just uh, an artifact of the digital SLR camera, uh, just leaking through the, the different colors on the, the bare filters, so it appears orange, even though in reality it's invisible to the human eye, uh, which is actually really important for, for robotic operation. So just to uh, uh, go over some of the instrument itself, uh, for those of you that, that may not yet be familiar, this is the uh, robotic P60 telescope at Palomar Observatory. It was converted to robotic operation in 2004 uh, to do automatic uh, follow-up of uh, gamma ray bursts and uh, for characterizing supernovae. Uh, the, what makes a telescope robotic is it's, it can be controlled uh, exclusively from a command line and a computer. Uh, you don't have to have push button controls or anything else like that. Uh, it also has integrated safety systems. Uh, so if the, the weather turns bad, uh, it knows itself and can close the dome and protect the telescope. And it can also protect the telescope from users that may want to point the telescope into the ground or do other insane things that humans like to do occasionally. Uh, the other part of the system is the uh, ultraviolet laser guide star, which is a box that's just bolted onto the side of the telescope. This projects uh, the, a 12 watt pulsed ultraviolet laser. It focuses the light at 10 kilometers, and that's where we actually uh, use the, the Rayleigh return from this laser uh, to measure the atmospheric turbulence and then subsequently correct it. Uh, it's ultraviolet, so it's invisible to the human eye, and it's safe for uh, overflying aircraft. Uh, we can't flash blind pilots, which is a very important safety feature, so we won't be. Uh, sending any of the planes that are flying around San Diego into the ground, which is very important. Uh, it's also, uh, 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 excuse me, we, we still have to uh, coordinate our activities with the U.S. Strategic Command because this can uh, potentially still uh, endanger satellites, uh, but we have an automatic method of, of dealing with that. Uh, we also have the Cassegrain Adaptive Optics System, which is mounted at the back end of the telescope. We have integrated instruments and also ports for external instruments that we want to add down the road. And we also have uh, the electronics box uh, just up here on the top, which has a, a single computer which runs the entire telescope, uh, science instruments, and adaptive optics system. And it pushes the, the data once it's captured to another system, uh, which is located off of the telescope, which actually reduces the data. Uh, so uh, instead of going through 
don't know all of how this works. I'll just quickly uh, show you the adaptive optic system itself. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's about uh, 0.8 meters on a side here. Uh, it's basically all, every, all the optics are mounted to a breadboard and are flipped upside down and attached to the telescope. Uh, there's a small hole here where the light from the secondary uh, comes through and focuses. There's a pickoff mirror which sends that to an off-axis parabolic mirror which images the uh, uh, primary onto a def uh, MEMS deformable mirror. This is a little silicon device that has actuators and we can uh, add compensating phase delays across the, the telescope pupil to compensate for uh, turbulence. Immediately after that, uh, ultraviolet light is picked off by a dichroic to go to a wavefront sensor. Uh, visible and infrared light goes through another set of optics. Uh, we have an atmospheric dispersion corrector and an optional tip tilt corrector, which we can use uh, when we want. Uh, and that uh, light eventually gets split uh, with visible light going to a visible camera and infrared light uh, going to a fold mirror which sends light out of the, the adaptive optic system and, and we can place different modular infrared cameras uh, at that output. And uh, for a real thorough description of how this uh, system works, uh, I could spend several hours talking about it, uh, but instead uh, what we've developed is uh, the first, I think we have the first video astronomy paper on astronomical instrumentation. Uh, which we published earlier this year, and it goes through all the nitty-gritty details of every single component of the system, uh, how adaptive optic systems work, how they correct turbulence, how each of the individual components works, from the uh, range gating to the MEMS deformable mirrors, and then also sort of a, a real practical aspect of how do you operate an adaptive optic system when you're at the telescope. So we have this all posted online. Uh, it's freely available and there's a nice manuscript that goes with it too where you can find some more details. So I encourage you guys to have a look at that if you're interested in, in how this, uh, this system works. Um, and what you see when you actually run the system on sky, uh, is you see this high order correction. Uh, it'll kick in, in in just a few minutes or seconds. Uh, this is uh, Kruger 60, which is a nearby Endorf uh, binary star system. Uh, when the AO system actually kicks on, uh, the deformable mirror corrects the uh, atmospheric turbulence and so you see the point spread function for each one of these stars shrink and you can even see a little core of the, the PSF popping out on each of these uh, quick exposure images. And what we uh, do when we capture data is we actually capture fast frame rate data like this. Uh, the laser is insensitive to atmospheric uh, tip tilt just because of the uh, propagation up through the atmosphere and then coming back through the same optical path. So you can measure the, the high spatial order uh, turbulence, but you can't measure the lowest order. So you need some sort of way to uh, either do active tip tilt correction, or in this case, uh, we have an electron multiplying CCD camera, which has effectively uh, much less than one uh, read noise uh, for each frame. So we can take very short exposures. And then in software, after the fact, we can register all these frames <coughs> and synthesize the deep exposure. And that's what we've been doing for all the science that I'm, I'm going to present here today. And the results of that uh, registration process, uh, this is an example of that. This is a triple star system, Harlow 637, uh, imaged in RI and Z bands. So this is sort of the, the red visible and, and really short near infrared. Uh, what we did is we uh, locked on to the uh, bright core of this brightest star in the system, and we used that to register the entire frame. And we actually then measured uh, image metrics from a star that was well separated, so it was a little bit easier to understand the, the full width half max and, and stroll ratio. So these uh, wavelengths correspond to R, I, and Z band. And we're getting uh, resolutions in the core, uh, so just the, the central core of the PSF. They're getting close to a tenth of an arc second. And in the, the longer wavelengths uh, out to Z, you're starting to be dominated by diffraction in the telescope. So at the longer wavelengths, we're uh, the resolution uh, becomes a bit coarser. And we're uh, achieving Strel ratios that are sort of in the low 10 to 20 percent regime. And, you know, I should point out that we're working the visible, which is uh, not most, most large telescope AO systems work in the infrared. And about a decade or two ago, uh, when AO systems were first coming online, these are about the, the type of Strel ratios they were getting in the infrared. So, you know, we're kind of pushing this technology into the, the shorter wavelengths. And as far as the residual wavefront error this corresponds to, uh, you know, we're actually, because we're on a smaller telescope, there's not, not as much uh, turbulence to start with, which is nice, which, which really helps us. Uh, and we're sort of getting close to the 
uh, regime where we're at uh, in the sort of extreme adaptive optics uh, techniques where you know we're, we're working the visible and we're kind of doing high contrast, although this is on a, a small telescope. So we're getting close, but we're, we're not quite there. Uh, so I'll, I'll take you through a, a little whirlwind of uh, some of our initial science results. So we got this system working for the first time, the, the adaptive optics in uh, 2011 in August, and so. From 2011 to the, the following summer in 2012, we were using this for just a few targets uh, at a time, just understanding how the system worked and, and uh, optimizing it. Uh, one of our first uh, science results that, that came out of this uh, particular system, uh, this is led by uh, Nicholas Law, who's working in the PTF project uh, primarily at the time. Uh, we looked at uh, some of these uh, eclipsing M dwarf, uh, white dwarf binary uh, star systems. Uh, this is one that's actually quite faint and challenging for our system. Uh, you can see this has got a 0.2 arc second full width half max. Uh, nothing, you know, particularly interesting there. But one of the other objects in this particular study, we did find something. And this is where it, it uh, became kind of interesting. So uh, this object uh, in the center uh, has, is an eclipsing binary, uh, M dwarf, white dwarf binary. But then there's also this, this other object about 0.2 arc seconds off to the side. And uh, we, we looked at the, the spectral uh, lines for this, and it, it's well fit by still just a white dwarf and an M dwarf. So we, we suspected this third component is another uh, M dwarf in the system. And as long as it, it we're 99% confident that it's not a, a background object, and if that's the case, then for this particular object, it would be a, a tertiary uh, M dwarf at uh, 80 astronomical units. Uh, some of the other early target science uh, that we've done um, is just kind of confirming the absence of, of objects near uh, some of these Kepler objects where there may be contaminating uh, light sources. Uh, so we did this first for uh, Jonathan Swift uh, for his uh, study of Kepler-32. Uh, so this is an image of it. Uh, this is about the size of a Kepler pixel, so four by four arc seconds of boring, there's nothing else there. That's fantastic. Uh, so you can basically believe the light curve that, that Kepler's spitting out. So this is a, a contrast curve that we have. So we've put limits on companion brightness with RoboAO. Uh, so we get about three and a half magnitudes at half of an arc second and about four and a half magnitudes at one arc second. And it's really a, a reasonably smooth line, but, but this is all that we ended up publishing. Uh, of course, uh, John I don't know, wanted to be absolutely sure, so went and got some time with Keck. Uh, so first imaged this uh, in J-band, and actually the level of contrast that was achieved with NERC-2 and J-band is, is you know, about a half a magnitude deeper, but you know, reasonably uh, comparable. Of course, it's not quite the, the same case in, in K-band, where the, the strel is much higher, and they're able to get uh, another two magnitudes of contrast. But you know, this is you know, potentially very interesting when I uh, talk about the, the large number of objects we do uh, later on. Um, there was another one of these. Uh, you know, this is really great. You know, there's such a large community of uh, creative scientists here. Uh, so we did this again, uh, looking at KOI-256, which is another Kepler object. This is led by uh, Phil Muirhead. Uh, this is uh, the object, which is an eclipsing M dwarf, white dwarf uh, binary again. Uh, this is the object. And these are the uh, Kepler photometric apertures that they actually use to, to measure these precision light curves. We looked at it again. This object happened to be a little bit brighter, so we were able to achieve uh, a little bit deeper contrast in this particular object. You know, at 0.2 arc seconds, we got down to uh, a contrast of four magnitudes, and then farther out, uh, down to five. So, you know, this is kind of interesting. Um, but what was really cool is this, you know, we were able to help with this really cool result. So. KY 256 ended up not being a planet, it's a collapsing binary, uh, but it had evidence of gravitational lensing in its light curve. And so this, you know, was, ended up being kind of a, a big result. And so, you know, we were all really happy that we were able to, to make a small contribution to this, you know, pretty early on in our project. So, you know, that was great. We, we got this thing working, but the, the real power is when we automate this and actually try to get many, many targets at any given time. Uh, so we've actually, as I said, fully automated the system. Uh, there is an asterisk there. We still have to start the system at the beginning of the night, and uh, we still have a person on hand to just keep an eye on it. And you know, if something does go awry, we can just stop it and restart it and, and get it going again. 
Uh, and that's, that's something we're, we're hopefully going to change in the future. Uh, but all of this automation and the software, uh, I have to credit to Reed Riddle, uh, who's in the audience, who uh, pretty much uh, almost single-handedly wrote all of this code and directed the, the architecture of the software that's uh, uh, you know, been in development for the past couple of years. Uh, this whole system has been done in Linux and C++, which is very important. Uh, it's, it's very easy to debug this system, and it's also very important um, because it's easy for students to get engaged in this project and actually make meaningful contributions. So we've had several uh, students over the summers, uh, and even one graduate student, uh, work on the software of the system and, and, and do some really um, very useful things in the, uh, for the software. So this uh, system's been uh, sort of optimized now. We have target-to-target -target overheads, including the slew time between targets of less than 90 seconds. Um, which means that we can actually do uh, about 90 targets in an hour, and some nights we've even been able to do up to 240 or 250 objects in a single night, so this is a very, very efficient system. Uh, we also have an intelligent queue scheduler, and actually I should, I should point out here, this is um, where uh, Christina Hogstrom, who's a graduate student in aeronautics, uh, helped develop most of this, this software uh, during the, the past year and finally got it uh, finished uh, this past summer. And it's just been working beautifully. And it's been really nice. Uh, we can mix all of our uh, scientific programs. So I think at the moment we have seven or eight programs that we're doing all simultaneously. Uh, the queue basically picks out what is the best target to do next. Uh, it includes all of the um, uh, interfacing with the, the space command. So it'll make sure to do targets that we actually have clearance windows to, to use the laser in those particular areas and also look at uh, the scientific importance of different programs. So it's, a, it's a really a great system and it's really optimized uh, all the science that we're getting out of this now. And as I mentioned, uh, yeah, we're doing about uh, 20 objects an hour. And of course, we're getting tons and tons of data now. I think we've done uh, about 10,000 observations to date uh, with the system. And of course, we have to have a reliable data reduction pipeline on the back end, otherwise uh, it's not all that useful. So that's one thing we've worked on. And uh, the, basically, we have final reduced images that are processed and ready the next day after uh, observing the night before. So uh, just a, our first example of this uh, automation, uh, we did this for the first time in June of 2012. And uh, this is a little less spectacular now that we've done 10,000 objects. But uh, the first time we did this uh, was, you know, it's absolutely fantastic. We did 125 targets. Uh, just in a single night when we actually got the robot to work the first time. So we were absolutely ecstatic. And since we've done this, we've never looked back. We've just been doing more and more targets. So we're starting to do uh, AO projects now, uh, survey sizes in the thousands. And this is where I should uh, acknowledge Nick Law, who's our project scientist, who's really had a lot of the vision uh, for all the sort of primary RoboAO team science, as well as trying to engage a lot of the other scientists uh, many of whom are in this room, uh, to do projects with the RoboAO system. Uh, he's now a uh, faculty at, at North Carolina, and we're continuing to, to work with this. So I'm really happy with that collaboration. Uh, our first uh, large survey, uh, the one that we kind of sold the, the RoboAO system on, uh, was this big binary survey. I'll talk about that in a little more detail. Uh, you know, the 3,000 objects uh, that we've done so far, we've done in just 172 hours. Uh, we've also done Kepler characterization, which I'll go into a little bit more detail. Uh, about 100 hours to do almost 2,000 objects. Um, we've done several other surveys. I'll talk a little bit about this one. Uh, we've done a lot of follow-up on PTF, uh, either binaries or the eclipsing binaries. And I'm starting a new program. Well, actually, I've already started a program with some of my colleagues at Hawaii. Uh, and this one, this one's kind of kind of interesting. Um, working with uh, Eric Guidos and Megan Ansel in Hawaii. And um, so I, I had told them about how the system works and, and what we can do. And so I, uh, at some point I, I pinged uh, Megan, who's the, the student, uh, to give me a target list um, so that we could you know, start uh, this program. And initially I got about 10 or 20 targets. And I was like, you know, think a little bit bigger. You know, we can do a lot of targets. And so then she came back with a, a target list of 3,000 objects. And that, that just warmed my heart. So she was thinking the right scale. So I was really happy about that. 
Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this ultimate binarity survey. Uh, essentially, we've uh, teamed up with uh, Todd Henry and his recons uh, group. Uh, so what we're going to be doing, or what we've already done, I should say, is we've looked at uh, 3,000 uh, uh, nearby stars uh, that have been established through parallax measurements to be within 35 parsecs basically looking for binary fraction uh, any uh, companions. So what Roboia is doing is really uh, measuring this critical range uh, between where you'd find spectroscopic binaries and where you'd find C-limited binaries. So looking in the, the tenth of an arc second to an arc second range, uh, which is probing you know, from one to a hundred AU. And what's really important here is that we're doing this with a single instrument with the same systematics across the board. So we'll have just one big survey and it'll be really easy to compare results, especially across the, the different spectral types of stars that, that we're looking at. And just, uh, we had to show this little flashy graphic of two and a half nights of observing uh, for this particular uh, survey. So these are all three by three arc second boxes uh, showing many binaries uh, and other objects uh, that we discovered. And, you know, we just did this in two and a half nights. Uh, we found a couple of kind of interesting ones. Uh, this is tentatively a triple star system. I think we've even looked, uh, followed this one up. It is close by, so we, we do expect to see, you have this, well, we expect that this has uh, reasonably high proper motion, so we, we should actually look in our data and see if that's actually uh, a triple or uh, whether there's a background object there. So but we, we need to dig into this data. Uh, so some of the other ones we've, uh, other projects we've done, uh, this one ties into PTF. Uh, this one is led by Nick Law, but also done primarily in conjunction with his uh, undergraduate student, uh, Mil Terziev. Uh, what they did was designed an, uh, an algorithm uh, to detect binaries below the seeing limit uh, within, uh, you know, large surveys. So uh, I think they used uh, weak lensing techniques and, and algorithms to, to develop this. Uh, and so what they've been able to do is detect binaries that are even at a fifth of the, the scene limited resolution um, using these techniques uh, with a, a false positive rate of less than 5%. And um, hopefully going forward, if uh, this, this algorithm is applied to, for example, the, the PTF uh, data set, they, they, may, they should be able to find up to half a million binary stars and then, you know, with the, the several uh, years uh, that PTF has been in operation, be able to actually track those orbits. So what was really important, though, is that even though they had developed this algorithm and had, uh, think they know where all these binaries are, they need to validate this. And so an easy way to do that would be to use the, the RoboAO system that can look in high resolution and actually confirm, uh, look well below the, the seeing limit and confirm that these binaries are actually real. So we, we did this validation uh, in just two and a half hours on 44 systems. And so that's uh, what you see here in this image. So each box uh, is 10 by 10 arc seconds and it's coded with a little uh, colored dot, uh, either red, which means that there's likely no binary there, yellow, which is uh, sort of a, a possibility of a binary system, and then green indicates a, a high confidence uh, that there's a binary there. And the, the orientation of the oval is uh, the direction that the, uh, the algorithm predicted. So you see in, in all of the red cases, uh, we didn't find any additional components with the RoboAS system. And in all but one of the uh, yellow cases, uh, we found a binary component. This is actually a repeated case uh, in two different times. They just wanted to check this one out as it was a little suspicious. And in, indeed, there was no other component there. And then in all of the, the green cases, the, the high confidence cases, there were, uh, there was found a, an object and all of the orientations were, were correct. And uh, so let me move on to another uh, survey and this one's uh, uh, being done, uh, it's being led by Reed Riddle as well as Andre Togvinen, uh, Louis Roberts and a couple of guys at the U.S. Naval Observatory. Uh, so what they wanted to do is look at uh, solar type dwarf stars and try and understand their, metal or their multiplicity. Uh, so the idea was to look at known, uh, known binary stars, in this case I'm showing astrometric binaries, and look for higher order multiplicity to see if it happens to be there. This particular case, these are known astrometric binaries with new components that we've discovered. And then we've also looked at uh, many spectroscopic binaries uh, doing the same thing, looking for additional components, found another one there. 
And um, these results are, are getting close to being published uh, within the next couple of months, as I understand uh, correctly. So just a little teaser on some of the results that are going to be coming out of that. So a subset of the roughly 1,000 objects that we observed with this, uh, for this survey, uh, this is about 200 um, 10 arc second or wider uh, binary systems that we looked at. About half of those, uh, we didn't find anything. Uh, so, you know, no big surprise, I guess it happens. Uh, but what we did find is that uh, for about a quarter of the uh, brighter objects uh, in, the, in the binary pair, we actually found that they themselves were, were binaries. And in a small fraction of cases, we found that the, the fainter component was itself actually a binary. And then what was really surprising is that about a tenth of these objects are actually quadruple star systems. So this is kind of interesting and has a lot of uh, implications for, for stellar formation. So I'll move on uh, and tell you a little bit more about our, our Kepler survey. Uh, so as you know, Kepler uh, has been pointing, well, until the two reaction wheels uh, uh, sort of took a hiatus uh, permanently. Uh, they've been looking at one uh, uh, field near Cygnus, uh, monitoring uh, close to 200,000 stars and trying to measure these uh, extremely precise and accurate uh, light curves, looking for transiting uh, exoplanets. And, you know, this is a, a phenomenal uh, a photometry machine. Uh, but, you know, one of the, you know, one of the things that that comes at a cost of is the Kepler pixels are actually reasonably large on the sky. Uh, they're four arc seconds. Uh, and oftentimes the, the photometric apertures are several pixels wide. Uh, and one of the problems is you don't actually know what's, what's necessarily going on under those, those photometric apertures. So that's, um, so, you know, in sort of the, the statistical sense, this is great because we understand a lot, of, a lot about the statistics of planets in our, our galaxy now. Uh, but the, it gets a little fuzzy when you actually want to know about an individual object, uh, which oftentimes we do. So the, the RoboAO system, uh, we started the survey. It lets us spatially resolve these uh, Kepler pixels uh, by a factor of 40 in each direction. So what we're trying to do is understand what's contributing to these light curves that, that Kepler is measuring. So hopefully we find the, the main host candidate. That's number one. Uh, make sure that the star is actually there. That's usually the case. Uh, but then we're also looking for additional stars in the, the aperture, uh, you know, multiple systems. Uh, also looking for any blending background stars or eclipsing binaries that may be causing uh, false transit signals. Uh, most of the time, when we look at these things, we don't find anything else there. This is similar to the KY-256 and Kepler-32 I showed earlier. Uh, but a lot of times, if there are objects, we want to spatially resolve those so we can understand where the, the light's coming from. And with the RoboAO system, we're working in the visible, which is the same as uh, the measurements that are being made with Kepler. So it's good we can make a, a direct comparison right there. So what we're doing with the survey with RoboAO, uh, we're looking at all these Kepler objects of interest. Uh, these are uh, four examples of Kepler objects with other things in the field. Uh, each one of these boxes is about the size of a, a Kepler pixel. In this case, this is a triple star system. Uh, these are actually, you'd be able to find this in a, a scene limited image, although it'd be relatively faint. Uh, these other two are, you know, below the, the typical one arc second scene limit. It would be otherwise very hard to detect uh, in scene limited images. Uh, we're also doing visible bandpass photometry. Uh, this is a 1.2 arc second separated binary Kepler object. This is KY13. Avi uh, Spore knows all about this one. Uh, we've been working with him on getting this, this photometry. So what this lets us do is, is understand the a little bit more about the, the spectral type of each of these stars. Uh, and also, we can understand then uh, how this compares to the, the Kepler band pass, which is a broadband visible. And we've also been doing a little bit of work so far. This is preliminary about identif identifying exactly which uh, object is the, the transit host. But this is a little bit of work in progress. So uh, doing all of these objects, this has become a, a real numbers game, a uh, number of uh, other adaptive optic systems have been surveying these objects uh, the last couple of years. They've published surveys sort of on the order of 100 objects at a time. Um, but there are about 3,500 uh, candidate uh, planets orbiting about 2,600 stars. And only 76 of those roughly, I think this is right, you know, the, the number does creep up from time to time. 
Uh, only 76 have actually given in confirmed. So what we need to do is try and confirm a lot of these and they're, you know, this is a big hurdle because there's 2,600 objects that we need to look at. So this is where RoboAO comes into play. Uh, and I'll just kind of give you a little video for a second. This is us uh, starting our uh, Kepler campaign last year. Uh, so we're actually uh, starting at one part of the sky, the Kepler field's uh, moving over. We're looking at the telescope from the north and the, as the field is drifting, uh, the laser is kind of progressing across the sky. In this particular case, we observed 60 Kepler objects in about three hours. And here's uh, kind of another view of the system, but this time from the, the parking lot of the 60-inch telescope, trained on the, the Kepler field. So we're basically just kind of poking around, uh, looking at all the Kepler objects. And uh, the result of this uh, from 2012 was that we imaged uh, 715 of these Kepler objects. And we did this in about 52 hours of observing. And um, the result of this is most of the objects uh, didn't have any companion seen around them, but uh, 53 did. And uh, we note that uh, 44 of these are new detections. So we did redetect a few that, that other people had seen, but uh, 44 of these objects uh, shown here are, are new companions that we found. And so what that gives is a raw multiplicity rate of 7.4%. And if you try and correct for uh, uh, a chance association of, of background stars, you get closer to a, a little 5% uh, uh, multiplicity rate. And uh, I'm going to sidetrack a little bit here, uh, just something I'm kind of interested in, uh, just more as an adaptive optic scientist and, and looking at things in high resolution. Uh, what I want to show is these two stars first and then this here. We did some follow-up observing this past summer with NERC-2 on Keck. I uh, noticed the similarities between these uh, two awesome AO systems. So what we did is uh, looked at uh, one of these, some of these RoboAO objects. Uh, this one in particular uh, had sort of a strange elongation of the point spread function. Did not look like any of the other ones that we took about the same time when we tried to do our, our PSS subtraction techniques. Something weird was going on. And so we, we had a suspicion as to, w to what it was. So we decided to follow it up with NERC2. And lo and behold, it's a binary star, and it's actually uh, separated at our diffraction limit. So uh, even though we couldn't resolve it, uh, we knew there was something going on there, and we were able to confirm it with Keck. And again, we found some other uh, really low threshold uh, objects in the field. Uh, in this particular case, there's a three sigma speckle. We're not sure if it's speckle or, or a companion. We looked at it with uh, Keck and confirmed that it, it indeed was another object. Uh, we've done this for many other, about 30 other uh, of the objects that we've looked at with RoboAO so far. Here's just a, another uh, kind of interesting one. Uh, you might be able to see there's a uh, two and a half sigma detection of another star about an arc second away uh, in the RoboAO image. We subsequently looked at it with Keck and hey, there it is for sure. And then oh, there's another one there and uh, another one about two and a half arc seconds away. So. What's kind of interesting here is that the NEXA Exoplanet Archive said that there's two planets around this star right here in the middle, but nobody knew about these other ones. So now who knows what's going on? So, you know, this is uh, obviously, you know, we're going to have to do more follow-up of this particular object to, to figure out exactly what's going on and if any of these stars are even associated with each other. So, you know, sometimes this raises more questions than, than answers when we start digging around. So just back to the survey, uh, we're going to be submitting our, our 2012 results uh, hopefully next week. And I'll share with you some of the juicy details now, uh, although I won't get into a, a real discussion of it because I think that can lead to a long, uh, long heated debate uh, potentially. Uh, but one of the things that we've, we've found so far is that there's a difference in the, the binary fraction between single and uh, multiple um, uh, planet systems uh, by about a factor of two. This is uh, accounting for the, the probability of physical association. So this is sort of a, at the, the two sigma level. So this is kind of an interesting result that, that we can talk about at some point, maybe over wine and cheese. Uh, another thing that, that we found that was kind of interesting is um, we kind of, we split up the, this population of um, uh, multiples that we found into uh, the different uh, uh, radii, uh, so we actually made a split between uh, what we call giant planets and rocky planets. Maybe that's not the, the right definition, but we made a split at a radii of about 3.8 uh, 
uh, Earth radii, and just looked at the uh, uh, the, the period uh, distribution of the binarity fraction. And th there's a big spike here uh, with the, uh, the the larger planets at, at really short periods. Uh, these aren't detected uh, just because uh, I don't think they exist. But but this is a this is a real result, and hopefully we'll be able to say more with the the continuation of our our survey. So just to, to kind of recap here, uh, what we've done, uh, in addition to the, the 2012 results, which we'll be publishing soon, uh, in 2013, uh, this past year, we imaged another uh, 1,100 of these Kepler objects. Uh, so that brings our total to about two-thirds of them uh, at the moment. Uh, and uh, I've already just looked through the initial data set and uh, about a tenth of the objects uh, are actually multiples, and that's just uh, cursory uh, glancing. So it seems like the, the multiplicity fraction is actually higher in the, the new data set. Um, and we've also got visible colors for 100 of those multiple systems already. We, you know, we're using Keck to do some follow-on infrared photometry. And uh, what's really nice is we now have uh, approximately 17 nights uh, uh, this coming 2014 uh, to finish up the survey. And what's going to be challenging about this is, uh, you know, we've done, we've tried to do a, a pretty representative sample of the Kepler objects, but uh, some of the fainter ones have been a little bit more challenging. So uh, they're typically, uh, well, a lot of them are M dwarfs, uh, cooler, brighter in the infrared, you know, which is kind of good timing for us. Um, we're actually going to be uh, deploying uh, two infrared cameras uh, in next year. So the first of which is one that we're uh, doing in collaboration with our colleagues in, uh, at IUCA in India. So they're uh, developing this uh, infrared camera that's going to house an HDRG detector uh, that we had acquired uh, last year, uh, earlier, uh, about September of, of 2012. And uh, this is actually a, a, two, a fully working 2K device. Uh, and it'll have about a two arc minute field of view uh, corrected in the infrared. It'll work in JH and uh, K short. Uh, and it also has uh, fairly fine pixels uh, at 58 milli arc seconds, which is Nyquist uh, in the, the red uh, end of the, the near infrared. And uh, the, the current ETA for this camera is uh, March of next year. Uh, so hopefully uh, I'll be glad to see this, this come online. It'll give us uh, infrared imaging and uh, tip tilt capability. This is fantastic. Uh, now I'm at uh, uh, Hawaii uh, that also has an active infrared development uh, program. Uh, so we have a, a new type of sensor that we're uh, working on. Uh, this is a, a 320 by 256 uh, uh, infrared APD device. It's, it's more like, uh, if you want to think about like an electron multiplying CCD camera, but it happens to be in Mercad Telluride and is sensitive uh, to the infrared wavelengths. And this has been developed uh, by Gertfinger at uh, Celex, which is a, a company in Great Britain, uh, for ESO. And um, they're using it for the, the gravity uh, at VLT for fringe tracking, but they're actually, uh, their detector meets the requirements and they're not going to spend any more de money developing these. So we've, we've actually kind of picked that up at Hawaii. And uh, these are, because this is using a sort of a, a, an electron multiplication technique, we can really beat down the, the read noise in these uh, devices to get it to the sub-electron level. And we can do it when we're reading these devices uh, at full frame at kilohertz rates. So these are going to be uh, fantastic for doing any sort of adaptive optics work uh, in the infrared. So we actually had two of these devices show up at Hawaii at the end of October. We're working on getting these in a doer that uh, Jerry Lupino is building for us. Uh, it's supposed to be shipping this week. Uh, we're going to be testing this on Sky uh, just at the 88-inch telescope, um, hopefully either uh, in late December or in the spring of next year. Now, what I really want to do, and which we're going to do, is uh, bring this to uh, Palomar and augment the, the RoboAO system uh, and so we can do infrared tip-tilt sensing and, on the remaining Kepler objects of interest. So we'll be able to, to finish up the survey on a lot of these fainter objects, which um, is exactly what we're going to do. So this is all the, the, the work that's uh, still going on at, at Palomar Observatory. Of course, now I've moved on uh, to quote-unquote greener pastures. Uh, this is Mount Akea in the background. Uh, 
So what we're, or what I'm planning to do uh, now is to, to bring this uh, RoboAO system uh, to the summit of Mount Ikea. This is the 2.2 meter uh, telescope uh, owned by the University of Hawaii. And so this is kind of my telescope now. On some, I like to think of it. Uh, so what I want to do is actually take the, uh, the, the uh, prototype system that we've developed for the 60-inch uh, at Palomar, actually make improvements and turn this into a real facility class system. And uh, one of the nice things too about the 88 inch telescope is that it has a, a, a tertiary mirror uh, so it can actually feed two bent cast instruments. So we can permanently mount this uh, AO system and not have to take it off the telescope like we do with the, the 60 inch every time we have a, an observing run. So we should be able to just leave it there permanently and, and have it kind of on call if we're not doing one of our extremely large surveys. So I'm really excited about having a lot more time on the telescope uh, to use this system. I also have other people in Hawaii use it. Uh, one of the other really big benefits is, you know, this is a 2.2 meter telescope. It's getting close to the size of Hubble. So we'll have a similar level of uh, capability when it comes to uh, visible resolution. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to get this on sky in two years. And in addition to uh, all the science that we, we can do with it. Uh, I want to use this as a test bed for new instrumentation. You know, we have these ports on the system so we can actually plug in different AO fed instruments, uh, either like infrared tip tilt sensors or fiber feeds, which is still kind of in its uh, infancy in technology. So I'd like to, you know, basically test new technology in a challenging environment in sort of an easy way without having to, you know, like use up a uh, large telescope uh, time to do so. Uh, one of the nice things about this system, the scene is fantastic at Mount Ikea, uh, and with a much larger aperture, uh, the visible light AO is going to be even better uh, up there. Uh, we'll be able to take advantage of the fact that we do AO sharpening on our tip tilt stars. This is something that the, the large telescopes are going to be trying to do in, in the next couple of years. Uh, we can do it already. This is just a preliminary air budget for the system based on uh, uh, the system that we have at Palomar uh, this is based on uh, work that Rich DeCaney has done uh, for NGAO and we're uh, repurposing that error budget for uh, the RoboAO system and uh, you know these are basically the, the visible GR and I bands and then infrared J and H. We have the Strel ratios and uh, expected full width half maxes. And what's really uh, cool here where I, I think there could be some really big potential is that even in meeting seeing we're going to get a uh, fantastic level of correction even at the shortest wavelengths in the G-band, which nobody else is doing right now. So there, there could be some really cool science down here that, at the short wavelengths. And uh, just uh, what we're going to sort of baseline for this particular system, we'll have another electron multiplying CCD camera, which will have a approximately a half arc minute field of view. We'll basically work over the entire visible. Uh, and, and do tip tilt sensing in the visible. We'll also have another one of these infrared APD arrays uh, that'll give us uh, basically wide J and H uh, imaging capability as well as the ability to uh, work in the infrared. And then we'll also have a few other um, uh, external instrument ports. So we can either uh, do things like have a F10 feed, which we can use the existing instruments that are built for the 88 inch telescope, or we can have a very slow port to go directly onto detectors like the Hawaii 4G that we have or some of the other instruments like optic uh, that are already in hand. And some of the, the, the real drivers for science for this particular system, uh, the, the real big one that, that's coming up is uh, doing uh, follow-up of test objects. So the test is kind of like a follow-on to uh, the Kepler mission, but instead it's going to be looking all sky and it's going to be much shallower. So it's going to be identifying quite a, a large number of objects and we're going to be trying to do analogous angular resolution characterization of all these objects, much in the same way that we're doing with Kepler. Uh, the majority of these targets are, are brighter, actually, than, than all the Kepler objects. So this is, should be a piece of cake for us. And then um, there are potentially 5,000 or 10,000 or even more of uh, these uh, transient candidates that we'll have to validate in a similar way. But this is going to be a piece of cake for this system. And I also put up here K2, because this is a, a new thing that uh, Kepler may be repurposed to uh, go around the, the galactic plane and, and start doing some of this work as well. And so we may be uh, equipped to uh, start following up the K2 candidates before uh, test launches. And one last uh, thing that we have uh, some good synergy with at Hawaii, 
Uh, we have this uh, NASA-funded ATLAS project, which Don Tonnery is setting up, which stands for the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Glass Alert System. Um, what's really important about this is that even though it's a couple of small telescopes, it's going to be scanning uh, the entire sky twice a night, uh, looking for uh, hazardous asteroids. And, uh, but it will find a lot of supernovae uh, as well as other asteroids, and so we'd like to trigger uh, from this system, uh, trigger the RoboAO, and uh, try and get high resolution images of a lot of these objects uh, and with possibly a near infrared, uh, low resolution IFU spectroscopy on, on many of these. So, getting near the end, uh, but just before I finish, uh, I have to uh, uh, say a few thank yous. Um, I've been at Caltech for, I think, a total of a decade now, uh, spanning about 15 or 16 years. Uh, and there have been a, a few people that have been absolutely critical to my career uh, in astronomy, and so I have to uh, point these people out and thank them. First one is Nick Scoville. So he was my undergraduate uh, mentor and uh, really created some awesome opportunities uh, you know, setting me up with uh, doing research in Owens Valley, and then subsequent to that, uh, finding me another research opportunity at JPL, and that's kind of uh, the end of the story. It all kind of went on from there. So uh, thank you very much, Nick. I, I really appreciate that. And uh, next one is uh, Rich DeCaney, uh, who uh, really has, has been a good friend and a mentor. Uh, has been taught me everything I know about adaptive optics. Uh, and uh, it's just been extremely helpful, and even to this day, we're, we're continuing to collaborate. And I really appreciate uh, Rich's efforts. And uh, Sri Kalkarni, uh, who's been my postdoctoral uh, sponsor at Caltech uh, past five and a half years, uh, I really appreciate um, all the opportunities that, that he's given me uh, to lead this project, and I, I'm really happy that he, he's doing that with other uh, young scientists giving them all the resources they need to succeed. So I'm very, very thankful. And of course, uh, the rest of uh, the crew at Caltech Optical Observatories and the staff at Palomar uh, have just been uh, a pleasure to work with, and, and I'm going to miss everybody. So with that, thank you very much. That's, that's right. So we're, we're going to be doing, uh, for the, the test follow-up with the, the RoboAO system, uh, we're going to be trying to do a similar sort of thing, looking for either false positive events or even just uh, if they're binary systems, uh, just trying to understand uh, what, uh, what, what happens to be there. So if it's a binary or a triple star system, that's, you know, one of, one of the other things that uh, is, I think it's still even changing the, the, the angular resolution of tests. Uh, when I was at the Kepler Science Meeting recently, they had announced uh, 20 arc second pixels, which was uh, news to me, and that, that had gotten larger since last time I talked to the people at MIT. So uh, you, you'll get a long way with uh, seeing limited observations, but even having this diffraction limited uh, ability on the 2.2 the .2 meter, I mean, you're going to get really close into the star and, and really see if it's a, a tight binary or, or something else. Uh, many of the stars will be in our sample already, yes. So the, uh, like all of the, the nearby stars that have been identified in the, the recon sample, for example, uh, you know, we'll have imaged already, uh, but there are potentially a lot more that tests will find that are not, uh, that we haven't seen yet. I, I apologize that I, I cannot answer uh, that, that question very well. So I, I, I think we'd have to, to send that to, to Nick and uh, Nicola and uh, Tim Morton who are, who are doing that correction factor. 
So that I, that is a it's a valid question, and it's uh, I, I don't understand it that well, or how how they how they do that. Yes, it is. That, so that's uh, that's actually what uh, uh, with when we're uh, when we talked about tying in with the Atlas project, John Tonry was like insistent that we have an IFU on the the back end of uh, RoboAO system. So we're we're going to have to figure out exactly what's needed there so we don't over engineer something, uh, and we we need to be very careful about that. But yeah, that that, that would be a, a fantastic capability to have, and that that's one we're we're planning on. Uh, well, we're we're still looking for for partners. So uh, actually, Nick Nick and I have been talking a little bit now that he's at, at North Carolina. Uh, he has uh, access to the the SOAR telescope, and they do have a a single uh, Rayleigh beacon system there. I I see what you, I see your hand motions. Yeah. Um, so we're we're thinking about uh, coming up with a a, a newly engineered uh, AO system for that. Uh, the challenge though is that. Um, it is on a, I think it's a 4.3 meter telescope, and uh, that's a little bit beyond what a single laser beacon can do. So we may look at uh, trying to do some sort of ground layer tomography and add multiple uh, Rayleigh beacons uh, to that telescope. Uh, and then we may be able to actually make a, a pretty slick AO system. If we did that, we'd have to make it robotic. So that's an option, or uh, if we can find uh, somebody else with a sort of one and a half to, to three meter telescope, we can kind of replicate the system as it stands. So when you make these plans for monitoring depth, uh, that's that's actually one of the things that that we have done, um, and I, I didn't present that. Uh, just the, uh, uh, the scientist that was leading that just kind of fell off, and uh, so we're we're not pursuing that that science objective at the moment. But one of the things that we we have been doing is uh, monitoring um, M15, uh, trying to just look at you know the the dynamics of the the cluster and trying you know come up with some constraints on the the presence of an intermediate mass black hole there. Uh, I know Hubble has taken some some recent images of M15 as well. Yeah, that I I think we're we, we've got some competition, strong competition in the galactic center, so. That, uh, that, that's possible, yeah. But we, I, I don't. I think they really need the the higher angular resolution uh, that they can get on the the largest telescopes. And you know, we are getting close to that in the visible. But as I understand, the galactic center is highly extincted, so the visible light capability is really not going <laughs> to do anything, unfortunately. Oh, okay. Uh, that, that's that's certainly a possibility. Okay. Thank you so much for that.